everyone, it's Hannah and Kaylin back again with Double Talk Asks. You may remember the 2011 Disney movie, Mars Needs Moms, about a nine-year-old boy who sets off on a rescue mission after his mom is kidnapped by aliens. The film had a $150 million budget, with an additional $60 million in marketing costs, a strong voice cast, and was released by Disney, yet a quick Google search immediately brings up a top asked question, why did Mars Needs Moms fail? Critics say the box office disaster can be credited to a phenomenon called the Uncanny Valley. The theory was first introduced in the 1970s, and theorizes that as humanoid characters and robots appear more human-like, they become more appealing, but only up to a certain point. We called robotics and automation researcher Ken Goldberg to discuss the hypothesized relationship between the degree of an object's resemblance to a human and our emotional response to it. Listen in. For those of us who don't have a technical and aesthetics background like you do, how would you explain the uncanny valley? First of all, it's very important to know about the, the history of the word uncanny. The story about the uncanny valley goes back to this wonderful tale by a German writer called The Sandman. And it's about a boy who falls in love with a robot. Very fascinating tale, very complex. And you don't know what's, what's, what's true, what's real, what's not. There's a lot of interest at that time in, in automata, artificial beings. A hundred years later, Sigmund Freud writes an essay that he titles Das und Heimlich. Now he's writing about the first book we just mentioned, The Sandman. He analyzes it and he says that there's a sensation or an emotion, as he puts it, that, is just, that, that comes up in a book like this. And he comes up with a name for it that he calls Unheimlich. In German, Heimlich means something that's familiar, that's uh, like your family. And Unheimlich means something that's unfamiliar, that's not your family. And that term, Unheimlich, gets translated into uncanny. Uncanny, like not kin, not not family. You guys are familiar with deja vu? Yes. yes. And that's where, you know, you come in something, you, some a new place and you say, I feel like I've been here before, right? So that's when the strange is familiar. The uncanny is like the opposite of that. It's when something familiar, like you come home in your house that you've been to a million times and it suddenly feels strange to you. And you can't put your finger on why, but it's just something about it that should be familiar, but suddenly it's, there's something uncomfortable about it. It also appears in things like stories about vampires. And vampires are very similar because vampires are something that looks normal, it looks like, a, looks like your, your, your friend or girlfriend, and suddenly, you know, it bites your neck and starts sucking your blood, right? So this is a case of, of uncanny because it's something that looks familiar, but then suddenly has this darker side. Another example, of course, is zombies. Same idea, really, because zombies are also something that sort of looks real and then, you know, suddenly turns on you. And the way all these, the, both zombie and werewolf movies play out is that they're always about this uncertainty. Is it, is this person okay? Or is this person, you know, a werewolf or a zombie? Right. And that uncertainty is exactly this idea of the uncanny. Often you see the word empathy as it relates to this. And I know there's a correlation between the degree to which a humanoid looks like a person. You could either look more like a real person or less like a real person. But that's tied up in our emotional response. And I'm just interested in the term empathy specifically. Do you explain that in yes. that context? Actually, your timing is perfect because this is the... This is the right image to discuss that. This is called the empathy test. It's a scene from the classic film Blade Runner. And in this film, the, the, the man you see here, uh, Decker, uh, Harrison Ford, is basically trying to figure out who is an android, uh, essentially a robot, and who is human. And there's this test that you take where it tries to basically sense your empathy and a robot wouldn't have quite the same empathy as a, as a human being. So a robot can fake it, but it can't really have real empathy because empathy means you feel as though you are that person. Now, this gentleman is a Japanese uh, scholar and researcher. He's building prosthetics. These are like hands and legs to, for people who have lost their arms, let's say in an accident or in a, in a, in a, in a war. He writes this amazing essay that basically describes this phenomenon that if you make the hand too lifelike, it backfires and people actually get kind of freaked out by it. They get weirded out. 
it's creepy. If the thing looks too familiar, it becomes creepy. Now, here's the, here's the Uncanny Valley plot. As you make robots more and more human-like, then they become more likable. Now, here's where it changes. Suddenly, there's a phenomenon that if you make it too human-like, it backfires. And suddenly, the, you don't like it at all. Okay, that's the Uncanny Valley. That's when you've pushed it too far. It's too close for comfort. I like to say. So that's where you've taken this idea of making something human-like, but it's now I can't tell the difference. And now I get that uncanny feeling in the back of my neck because I'm not sure, is it real or not? And there's many examples. So this is an example of a doll that you can actually buy. It looks very much like a real baby, right? And most of you would agree that this is uncanny, right? It looks, it looks real, but I don't know if it's real or not. And so I'm not comfortable with this. In cartoons like Pixar and Disney, I've figured out is that they should make the eyes not lifelike. So a lot of the scenes can be very lifelike, but the eyes generally are not. Here's a great example. Ooh, I don't like that. Sophia. Right. I don't like Sophia. Okay. <laughs> There's many examples of robots that are, are, are very lifelike um, and they make us very uncomfortable. I can't tell who's the human and who's the robot. I feel like that. Exactly. No, exactly. I don't like that. Exactly. It affects everything from robots to design to even voices. Like if a voice, series voice, sounds too lifelike, it makes us uncomfortable. It's, it's a very profound concept that you see all over in our environment today. How might the study of the Uncanny Valley threshold be helpful to us in the future, whether it's filmmakers or artists? Is there anything that we can take away from this to relate to something else? Absolutely. You can think of it as it's very important to design. So if you're a designer and you're trying to design something, that you want to be accepted and liked. You want to make sure that it doesn't trigger this uncanny valley. So you either want it to be on one side or the other, but not at that difficult, complex point. So it's something you have to watch out for as a designer. And it's true for artists because artists and filmmakers and authors can use it to think about we're actually intentionally pushing things into the uncanny valley because it creates an interesting emotional response that you can play with. I just want to end with um, this photo, which is uh, Diane Arbus' famous photo of identical twins like you two. And it has, it's still etched in people's minds because it has an element of the uncanny in it. It's that they look almost the same, but they're not quite the same. And this is the same, I think it's the same emotional reaction that you have when you look back and forth and you, you see that they're you know, the same, but you think maybe it's just a, she just copied the same image twice. And I hope that this is helpful for, for your audience, because I think it's a fascinating topic. It's very relevant to our experience today. And it's something that you can, you can benefit from, as you said, for designers, for artists, for writers, and for all of us, just to be aware of this when, when it's triggered in, in our own, in our own experience.